According to the theory of evolution, the origin and development of the universe and all its systems can be explained solely on the basis of time, chance, and continuing processes. All living things have arisen from a single-celled organism. A second and opposing worldview is the concept of creation. According to the theory of creation, everything in the universe has come into being through the design, purpose, and deliberate acts of a supernatural creator. That means this creator created the universe, the earth, and all life on earth, including all types of plants and animals, as well as humans. Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman. It's my great privilege to be your host. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. We have a fantastic show for you today. We are going to be talking to the executive producer of Evolution, the Grand Experiment. And uh, it is a, it's one of the, frankly, best done DVDs I've ever seen in the whole creation evolution debate. And before we meet our guest, I want you to watch the introduction to this tape so that you'll see what a quality product we have for you. For thousands of years, most believed in a creation account, a spectacular event in which God spoke, creating stars and planets, animals and sea creatures, birds, plants, and human beings. In 1859, the scientific and religious establishments were rocked by a new theory, one with a twist. Charles Darwin proposed that all living things developed through an exceedingly slow process over millions of years, naturally. He shockingly suggested that man was not created by God. Rather, man evolved from apes and other lower animals. In his day, Darwin's book was a phenomenon which drew a firestorm of criticism. His theory created a conflict between those who believed in a six-day biblical creation and those who ascribed to this newly proposed, slow, natural evolution. Now, 150 years later, evolution is the dominant theory for the origin of life in most scientific and academic circles. Many scientists are concerned that the public has not embraced the theory of evolution. Gallup polls have repeatedly shown that most Americans do not believe that life formed naturally over millions of years. Rather, they still believe that God created the world and reject any theory that is not based on supernatural explanation. I believe that something had to put us where we are. It's too big, it's too universal for us to just like evolve from one cell. Did we come from monkeys? I, I don't know. Um, there's evidence for it, but then there's also some stuff missing. So you know, making that leap between, you know, with, with a missing link there, yeah. and I have some problems with it. Only 13% of Americans believe in the purely mechanistic theory of evolution, that humans evolved from apes, and God had no part in the process. You know, yes, I do believe in the theory of evolution, because I figured we had to come from some place in a, you know, from ape to man to where we are today. Yes, I do. I definitely believe in evolution. Do most reject evolution because the theory is implausible? Do they not believe because of their religious views? Or is it because they are unfamiliar with the theory? Darwin's evolution theory remains a divisive issue, but this conflict is nothing new. Even before Darwin, there were other natural explanations for the origin of life that conflicted with the biblical story of creation. Well, we have Dr. Carl Warner with us today. Dr. Warner is a graduate of the University of Missouri. He is a physician by trade, and, uh, but he has this incredible interest in 
in, in the grand experiment, in looking at evolution and seeing if it's true. Dr. Warner, it's so good to have you with us. It's great to be with you. Thank now, you. by the way, your DVD, uh, it debuted here on Cornerstone Television Network, didn't yes. it? Yes, it did in uh, 2009, and we're very appreciative for Cornerstone giving us that opportunity. Well, we are thrilled to have it, have it uh, be a part of uh, what we do here. Uh, you know, one independent group said that this was the best documentary on the whole creation evolution debate that was ever done. I sort of, the more I watch, I, I tend to agree with that assessment. Uh, it's great having you, and, and what an incredible labor of love this has been. Uh, 30 years you've been working on this. Well, uh, this came to me. I didn't go seeking it. I was in uh, medical school. I was 19 years old. I believed in evolution, and a friend came to me and said, Carl, you believe in evolution? I said, well, yeah. And he says, uh, how do you deal with these problems? And he presented to me three questions that changed my life. He said, you believe that the Big Bang occurred, out of, you know, formed the universe out of the Big Bang. How do you form matter for the universe out of nothingness? And then he you know, showed me that this is a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. And I thought to myself, hmm, that's very interesting. Something from nothing. Something from nothing, and that's a violation. Then he said, Carl, you believe that life began from chemicals to begin evolution. I said, well, yes. He said, how could that have occurred since this violates the ideas of biochemistry that DNA does not form out of chemicals and proteins do not form out of chemicals? How could you begin life without DNA and proteins? And I thought, my goodness, that's a good argument. Then he presented to me the fossil record. He said, Carl, we have hundreds of millions of fossils. Why are there gaps between animal groups that you know, seemingly go against the theory of evolution. And at that point, I realized I was, uh, I was challenged that there was something wrong with my way of thinking. I believed in evolution, yet he just more or less decimated my Three ideas. Three questions took the pins out from my Took the pins out, and now I was confused. I thought, you know what, I have to go look into this thing. So I began what later became a grand experiment, testing the theory of evolution, going and traveling all over the world to, to settle this for my own question. And uh, I can't take uh, all the credit for the DVD. There's a lot of people that contributed to this project. For example, I don't know if you noticed the great narrator Andres Williams from London who's wow. done Discovery Channel and the like. And then the music was scored by Simon Wilkinson from England also. And uh, he did a fabulous job. And um, the vid videography was done by my wife uh, who has a great talent for that. Our writer, Carla Zara, my director of photography, George Tikachek, and there's a whole list of people. I'm going to probably miss somebody, but uh, the whole list of people that made this project what it is today. You know, one of the things that I've learned being in the ministry is that nobody can do real ministry unless God builds a team. Mm -hmm. And it, when the parts of the body come together correctly, then mm -hmm. it's incredible what God can do. Yes. Well, today we're going to talk about... Uh, whales. You've done some groundbreaking work uh, on whales. Um, it's, it's kind of most people, unless they've really studied this area, don't know that Darwin in his first edition of Origin of the Species informed us that whales came from bears, but not just from any bears, from black bears. Yes, uh, you heard it right. Uh, uh, <laughs> many people say, did he say bears? Black yeah. Whales from bears? And yes, uh, Darwin wrote this in The Origin of Species, the first edition and he almost got laughed out of London. His friend said, what are you talking about? Bears going into whales? He says, no, I really believe this. They said, Charles, you're gonna lose this whole argument before you get started. You better yank this. And he eventually took it from the origin of species and even though he thought it was correct. Whales are magnificent creatures capable of holding their breath for over an hour and diving to over a thousand feet deep. But where did they come from? Scientists who support evolution suggest whales evolved from a land mammal. For them, the fossil evidence is so convincing, the evolution of whales is offered as one of the best fossil proofs for the theory of evolution. However, scientists who oppose evolution argue that this fossil evidence is unreliable. Darwin thought that whales might have evolved from bears in The Origin of Species, he wrote, In North America, the black bear was seen swimming for hours with widely open mouth, thus catching, like a whale, insects in the water. I can see no difficulty in a race of bears being rendered 
by natural selection, more and more aquatic in their structure and habits, with larger and larger mouths, till a creature was produced as monstrous as a whale. Modern evolution scientists have abandoned Darwin's idea of a bear evolving into a whale. So the modern evolutionists have abandoned Darwin's bear-whale theory, but whales are very significant to the, even the present day uh, evolutionary community because they believe this is one of the places where they have the best uh, ancestral chart. Is that right? Yes, they would say the evolution of a uh, ground mammal to a whale is the best evidence they have and I then decided to systematically look into this. And I got the evolution uh, charts for how uh, this evolution would occur. And I started asking questions. The first thing that uh, struck me is why does everybody have a different animal that evolved into whales? For example, the California Academy of Sciences says it was a hyena that became a whale. A different museum says it was a cougar-like animal that became a whale. Another one says it's a wolf-like mammal. Darwin says it was a bear. That seemed odd. Well, which one was it that became a whale? Then we started to decipher the charts and say, show us the fossils here for this animal. And we realized that the charts reflected uh, something quite different from reality. The scientists actually had created the fins and the tail, the whale's tail, on the animal called Rhodocetus. And we were interviewing them on camera, and this revelation became known. It was, it was stunning. This is a... Uh powerful segment uh, from Evolution, the Grand Experiment. And uh, I just want our folks to uh, look at this because when they go to a museum and they see these charts, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have to believe everything they read. Don't believe anything unless you can see the fossils. Scientists at the University of Michigan suggest whales evolved from this cat-like animal because of the similarities in the teeth while scientists at the California Academy of Sciences believe this hyena-like animal evolved into a whale because its teeth are similar to some extinct whales. Biologists in Japan suggest whales evolved from a hippopotamus-like animal based on similarities in the DNA. Detractors of the theory ask, if whale evolution is so clear and if the fossil record is so abundant, why can't evolution scientists agree upon which land mammal changed into a whale? There is great excitement in the scientific community over the discovery of a few important missing links between a land mammal and modern whales. But what's good about this particular, these particular um, fossil whale specimens is that they do show us intermediates in the evolution of whales. We don't often get um, fossil intermediates, so we can actually trace the development of characters, say for example the evolution of swimming in whales. We don't often have that opportunity. They have a big exhibit on it in Michigan. I was just there. They have they have all these things just sitting out there. I mean, they're they're all there. I mean, you'd you really have to be blind or three days dead not to see the the transition among these. You don't, you have to not want to see it. As shown in this diagram from the University of Michigan Natural History Museum, Ambulocetus is one of the important transitional fossils in whale evolution. It is thought by some to be a walking whale. Just in the last five or ten years, we've had some remarkable discoveries of fossil whales. And in fact, um, there have been discoveries that have indicated that um, fossil whales had feet and actually walked on the land. Frankly, I don't know why they could call that creature a whale. I have never seen a walking whale, and I've never seen a pig that flies. And they suggested some of these creatures were, were intermediate. You, frankly, I just don't believe it. They believe that because they want to believe it. Recently, some evolution scientists have backed off the assertion that Ambulocetus was an ancestor of modern whales because its eyes are high up on the head, like an alligator's eyes, quite dissimilar from whales and land mammals. Ambulocetus may be on a slight sideline, and we think that mostly because it's very strange it has its eyes raised up on top of its head in a very strange way. And it's unusually large for an early whale, but mostly the eyes up on the top of the head seems like an unusual specialization. Maybe it's not on the main line. Evolution scientists claim the most spectacular intermediate fossil in whale evolution is Rhodocetus, an animal with four legs, a whale's tail called a fluke, and flippers. 
It would swim using its widened tail fluke, like a modern whale, but it had four legs like a land mammal. A perfect transitional fossil between land mammals and aquatic mammals, just as Darwin predicted. The fossil whale that appears a little bit later is Rhodocetus, and this animal had um, large tail vertebrae that indicate there were lots of room for muscle attachment. So here we see the beginning of the type of locomotion that's characteristic of the modern whale, using um, just the tail flukes for propulsion and not using the hind limbs. We have a complete modern whale type structure in Rhodocetus. There are no, uh, not many modifications from Rhodocetus to the modern whale other than changes in size of the uh, structures. When this video series was being filmed on location at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, the executive producer noticed a discrepancy between museum drawings of Rhodocetus and the fossils. The reconstruction of Rhodocetus had a whale fluke, but there were no fossils of the tail to confirm this. Dr. Phil Gingrich, the scientist responsible for the discovery and reconstruction of Rhodocetus, was questioned how he knew there was a whale fluke on Rhodocetus since that part of the fossil was missing. What was the uh, reasoning that it, uh, the scientists think there was a fluke on Rhodocetus um, based on the other pieces of anatomy? Well, I told you we don't have the tail in Rhodocetus. So we don't know for sure whether it had a ball vertebra indicating a fluke or not. So I speculated it might have had a fluke. Scientist Gingrich also acknowledged that the flippers were drawn on the diagram without these fossils. Now, he does not believe this animal had flippers. Again, his answer was surprising, since the museum diagrams had flippers on Rhodocetus. Now since then, we found the forelimbs, the hands, and the front arm, the arms, in other words, of Rhodocetus. And we understand that it doesn't have the kind of arms that can be spread out like flippers are on a whale. And if you don't have flippers, I don't think you can have a fluke tail and really powered swimming. And so I now doubt that Rhodocetus would have had a fluke tail. Many experts consider whales to be the best fossil evidence for evolution, but are unaware of these discrepancies. Opponents of evolution contend that whale evolution is nothing more than hopeful supposition. If museum diagrams are redrawn and corrected for various discrepancies, opponents argue that whale evolution is non-existent. That's unbelievable, Carl. Absolutely unbelievable that you went to the man who made the drawing, put the flippers and the tail on Rhodocetus, not from any evidence, but from his assumption, and all the other scientists read his things as if it's the gospel truth. And it collapsed during and, the interview. And as soon as you show it's an assumption, there really is no evidence at all. The whole thing collapsed. What makes people want to believe or think in the first place that a whale had to come from a land animal? Well, whales and land mammals are both mammals, are warm-blooded, and so sure. they have thought in the past that maybe a land mammal could become a whale through uh, uh, volition, hoping to get a body part that it needed to swim or whatever, but that, life doesn't work that way. The only way you could get a body part for swimming would be by an accident, and it would have to be a monumental accident of letters of DNA, 900 of them, being inserted into the DNA of the reproductive cells. When you look at the odds of this happening, it's unbelievable. Let me just say that. This goes to a cardinal belief of Darwin's, doesn't it? That, that through volition, animals could change from one animal to another? Yes, and Darwin was wrong on this. He was wrong on use. He was wrong on disuse. He was even wrong on the idea of adaptation. Scientists today, biologists who believe in evolution, have rejected this idea that you could adapt by a need in the environment. Darwin suggested that the survival of the fittest, or natural selection, was another mechanism for evolution. He thought that nature would favor the strongest varieties within any species and the weakest would eventually die off. The surviving varieties would improve over time and eventually evolve into a completely new species. Some scientists argue that natural selection does not have the power or capacity to theoretically cause evolution. They contend 
that this process can only select or remove traits for a species, but not create new body parts. To better understand their argument against natural selection, one has to go no further than an animal breeder who uses the process called artificial selection. Artificial selection mimics natural selection, but instead of nature making the reproductive choices, a breeder makes the decisions, consciously. In both processes, there is a limit to how much can be accomplished by breeding. For instance, dogs have a limited number of genes or variations coded in its DNA, such as color, shape, or size. Using artificial selection, a breeder cannot go beyond these limits. Breeders have created a four inch tall Chihuahua and a three and a half foot tall Great Dane, but they cannot produce a 10 foot tall dog or a one inch dog. Breeders can select for dogs with short hair or long hair, but they cannot produce a dog with feathers. Natural selection and artificial selection can only promote characteristics that are already present in an animal's gene pool, but cannot add completely new genes or body parts to any animal species. Scientists who support evolution have recognized this limitation of natural selection. Now there is a new theory of evolution to explain how animals could theoretically develop new body parts, such as wings or eyes or feathers. The new theory of evolution called Neo-Darwinian evolution suggests that animals did not evolve by effort, need or as a direct response to the environment as Darwin thought. Rather, mutations in the genes of the reproductive cells would cause one animal to slowly change over time into another. This new theory of evolution suggests that a carnivorous land mammal became a whale by accidental mutations. In trying to understand the evolution of whales and dolphins from four-legged terrestrial carnivores, the first thing you have to keep in mind is that chance plays a, a tremendous role in this. Scientists who oppose evolution suggest that changing one animal into another by accidental mutations is preposterous. If a carnivorous land mammal, such as a hyena, evolved into a whale, too many body transitions would have to occur by chance. The hyena's front legs would have to change into pectoral fins. Its back legs would have to disappear. Its nostrils would have to move to the top of its head and form a blowhole. The hyena would have to develop a dorsal fin by accident. Its bony tail would have to change into a cartilaginous fluke. The hyena's hair would have to nearly disappear and be replaced by blubber. Its body would have to increase to 80,000 pounds. And its external ears would have to disappear and change for high pressure diving. Each of these new traits would require at least one new structural protein. Each protein would in turn necessitate adding 300 letters of DNA to the genetic blueprint in the proper sequence. This would be equivalent to a blindfolded toddler typing several pages of meaningful paragraphs into a completed book, or to a person throwing a die thousands of times in a row, and each time it came up as three. Given these improbable odds of evolution occurring through accidental mutations, some scientists are now questioning the theory of evolution. Some scientists are now questioning the theory of evolution. Uh, Carl, it's been wonderful to talk about whales, especially when you stop and think, this is supposed to be the strongest at place where we have the strongest evidence for transition, and there isn't any evidence for transition. No, when you look at the gaps, it's incredible. Yes. And uh, if this is the best they have to offer, the theory is over. The theory of evolution is over. And it's just that no one's announced that yet, I guess. Yes or when it's announced it's not heard. Uh, this is the book, folks. I just want to tell you what incredible uh, work this is, both in the information and the quality with which it's done. It's a tremendous thing. And then the DVD that goes with it that we've been watching, and these are available, aren't they, sir? Yep. Um, the, the book also, I want to mention, has a teacher's manual to yes. it. You can use this as a homeschool family, you can use it in public schools, and you can use it in uh, parochial schools. And uh, the book has uh, 600 photographs that my wife took. And 
the book is as important as the video. So it's an integrated project, sure. and you can watch the video, you can watch the book, or you can do it as a class, or you can just do it as an adult. And I would say to my fellow pastors out there, there's also a PowerPoint set, uh, set that we could get to use this yep. at, in teaching. There's a PowerPoint uh, set, and uh, then there's also the next series is volume two, which is Living Fossils, talking about animals that were the same during the dinosaur time. It's a book, it's a video, and a teacher's manual also. Sounds like great material. So who do you envision as the audience? The audience is uh, you, you know, whoever you are. It could be a fifth grader. It could be mom, it could be dad, it could be grandma. You could also use the books as a tool to reach out to other people because there's no mention of G-O-D in the book. We don't mention that name because it's a science book. So you won't offend someone from Harvard or some science professor. Just read this book. It's Evolution the Grand Experiment. Actually, we quote their professors. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Not only are we going to offend your them, we'll quote scientists them. <laughs> are in your book. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Well, you have done an incredible work and in such a unique way. I just love the fact that the, the evidence that you're presenting is coming out of the mouths of the evolutionary scientists. Right. And uh, they're damned by their own... Uh, uh, admissions and I think that's great. That's the most credible information when it comes from the evolution scientists. If a scientist right. opposed to evolution gives the evidence, well, maybe it's tainted, but they're, they're giving the facts and then the audience gets the opportunity to, to say, that makes no sense or there's a big gap there. You know? it's, uh, that's, it's such a unique approach and it's so well done. Thank you, sir, for the incredible work you, that Don. you're doing and that you have done. And I just want to urge our, our viewers to, uh, to go to www.thegrandexperiment.com and uh, to get a hold of some of this material. It's uh, powerful material that I believe God can use in your life, and especially if you're talking to others who have questions, this is material that you would want to use as you share with others because it is uh, done by uh, world-renowned evolutionary scientists, and uh, it's done so very well, that, and it's done in a non-controversial way. So I think it's powerful material that you would want to use. You know, friends, we're so delighted here at Origins that we can have people like Dr. Warner with us to share what God is doing. And I do think that the day is coming when more and more people are going to have to simply admit that the evidence for evolution isn't there. You know, from the very beginning, it's always been God's view that He created you. And that should always be your worldview, too. It's been great having you with us here on Origins. Look forward to joining, you joining us again. And until then, God bless you, my friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 1008 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1008, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.